Hello, my name is Matt Cornock and in this video we'll be going through some basic accessibility concepts to improve the way that your web resources are made available to disabled users. This is actually quite a long video because I'll be going through a lot of the detail and a lot of the um, things that you can do to improve the accessibility of your websites and web resources. So first of all, making your websites and web resources accessible to all users regardless of disability is a requirement really of the UK Equality Act. There are some guidelines made available by the W3C organisation and these are called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.0. Accessibility though has significant benefits for all users. We're not just looking here at improving the web access for disabled users, but some of the approaches that you take forward when you're trying to make your website accessible will benefit everyone. And of course, if you have a better user experience, people are more likely to go back to your website and they're more likely to learn if you're developing a, a website for learning or education. So first of all, we need to consider some disabilities, and this is just a small selection, but we can broadly categorise the disabilities that we can address with accessibility into these categories. First of all, looking at visual impairments, then hearing impairments, motor impairments, language and dyslexia, which is a common learning disability. When we're looking at visual impairments, in, not just at blindness or uh, impairments that restrict the ability to see, but there's also colour blindness, which is a consideration we should consider. Screen magnifies. This is where someone's blowing up the screen in, so they can see portions of it at a much higher magnification. And people using screen readers. And this can be for people with visual impairments, but it can also be used by dyslexic students who ask the computer to read the text out on the screen as they're reading it along. For visually impaired users, screen readers are the main way that they will engage with websites because the screen readers convert whatever is shown on the screen into a text that's spoken back to the user. So some of the first tips then, don't use colour or visual characteristics alone for identification. For example, if you had two icons that represented start and stop and you asked your users to click the start button uh, or click the green button, then those that are visually impaired will not be able to determine what button that would be and those who are colour blind would see both of those as greyed out circles. So include instead text on the actual icon or you could include uh, different shapes as well. Where an image conveys a message then you should use the alt attribute to provide a text equivalent. Now I'll show you what this actually means in practice using a VLE, for example, blackboard. In this particular case I've got a standard web page text editor and I'm going to add an image to it. And you can see here in this particular upload window, I have a space here to add the image description. And for me, because there is text incorporated within the image, I need to put that in the image description. Now that alone might be enough, but if the image is trying to convey a message as well, or perhaps there's a, an atmospheric element to the image, I'd also want to describe it very briefly. For example, this image has a guy speaking through a meta megaphone. So I'm gonna just put that in here as the image description. So my image description now reads social media for social policy, photo of a guy shouting through a megaphone. So that's how I would add my description in a, in a VLE such as Blackboard. In WordPress, which is another common platform for websites, then you, there's actually an alternative text box here as well. And you can see, again, I've used text within this particular uh, image and I've incorporated that text within the alternative text box. In this case, I've not actually provided a description of the sketch line art drawing in the background because that isn't actually that important. It's not relevant. What's more important is the text based content on the image. So the message really is to provide enough detail to convey the meaning, but it is OK to include a description elsewhere on the page. And this is relevant for when you're showing charts and graphs. In this example, you can see on my website, I presented here a chart, which is an image and therefore is inaccessible to screen reading software. 
Instead of providing a detailed description of all the individual points within this graph, I've actually just provided within my alt text there graph showing desktop, laptop and tablet ownership for 2011, 12 and 13. Significant details discussed in the main text and table of 2013 results available below. So I'm saying essentially don't worry about this image because I explain it in text afterwards. And what I've done in the text is actually explain the main points and the trends. So I've conveyed what this graph is doing through text instead. At the bottom, I've also provided the most recent results, the ones that are relevant to this blog post in a table format so that people can easily find uh, the results and the accurate numbers. Because if we look at the graph as well, we don't really know the accurate figures from this uh, chart. So having a table is useful to everyone as well as those using screen reading software. I provided examples there where text was actually part of the image, but where possible, if you have the technical ability, don't put text within the image and instead lay it as normal selectable text in plain text format and place the image as a layer underneath it. You'll also need to consider the way that colour is used on your website, but not just colour, in terms of shade as well. So if we give this example here, this box here has a poor contrast. We've got a dark blue against a medium blue. And that's actually quite difficult to read if you don't have good vision. So instead of using that, think about different colour combinations, um, but all, not just colour, think about the tone as well. So I could use, uh, for example, a yellow, which would be at the same sort of brightness level as the blue. But if I did that and the user was printing it out on black and white or had some form of colour blindness, perhaps those colours wouldn't be distinctive enough. So think about lightness as well as colour contrast. For hearing impairments, you need to caption all videos with subtitles and, where appropriate, add descriptions of other relevant sounds. So this is also relevant to users without speakers or headphones, perhaps if they're listening to a video, perhaps they're watching a video in an office environment, they don't have headphones, they can't use speakers, or perhaps they're watching a video on a mobile device that doesn't have the best quality audio and it's difficult to hear what the speaker is saying. Captions are really useful. If we look at YouTube, there's an option within YouTube to add captions to your videos. If I play this now, you can see here how I've started with actually saying who's going to be speaking in square brackets. And then what I've been said is going over the top of the video screen there. Now, you can add this really easily within your uh, video manager page. If you go to your video list, then click the arrow next to the edit button and then choose subtitles and CC, which stands for closed captions. You can then look at the automated captioning which YouTube attempts, turn that off because it probably isn't good enough yet, and then add your own. Um, you can either upload a transcript uh, if you've got it typed out in Word or, or a text format, um, or you can manually type into YouTube the captions as you watch the video. If you're creating podcasts, it might be a little bit too onerous to create a full transcript of the podcast, but at least provide a summary of the key points. Another disability to consider are those uh, disabilities to do with motor skills, and uh, that could be um, the inability to use a keyboard or a mouse. These users might use uh, trackpads or they might use the keyboard alone and not able to use a mouse. And it is still possible to navigate websites without using a mouse. If you wanted to test your own site, use the tab key to navigate through your web pages and the enter key to activate links. You can also use the backspace to go back a page and that will give you an impression of how usable your site is without the use of a mouse. Complex language can also be a barrier. So you have to think about your target audience. Are you trying to reach an audience that is a very broad and very general public? How are they going to interpret your message? Could you convey your message in a visual way or in a simple English or plain English manner? If you can't, then you should consider a glossary page. And glossary pages are very useful to reaching a wider audience and explaining your view of the terminology that you're using. Because even if you're trying to target perhaps an academic audience with very specialist language used in that academic domain, it's not to say 
that different people will have different interpretations of terminology. Dyslexia is a very common disability and it affects the way that users can read the text on the screen. To make things easier, avoid using large blocks of text with uh, justification, full width and very small font and very little lining and very little structure at all. Instead, space your text out, include white space and left align your text. This makes it much easier to follow the lines as they are read line by line down the page. Where possible, also consider using bullets or visual representations rather than blocks of text. For example, if you have a block of text here that contains instructions or a sequence, then you can represent that with the bullet points, perhaps taking out some of the detail. Um, so if it's an instruction based uh, description, then you need to take out the detail, put the detail later on. Um, or you could perhaps represent that more easily as a, as a flow chart perhaps. So where there is sequential information, think about the way that can be reduced in some way to make it easier to follow the instructions one by one. You also need to emphasize with bold, do not underline or use italics. Um, first of all, if you see underlined text within a, a web document or online, the initial thought is that it's a web link and so if it's not a web link and it is underlined you're actually making it less usable because it's going against what people would assume would be happening. For italics, blocks of italics can also be difficult to read so when you want to provide emphasis just bold one or two words that deserve the emphasis. If you bold a whole chunk of text of course that's not going to stand out and you're going to lose the point of emphasizing it. But bold is a much safer way than using underlining or italics to draw attention to a particular part of the text. For users with screen magnifiers, you have to consider that the whole page might not be seen at once. So for example, with a screen magnifier, you may just see part of the page at any one point in time. And if on the side of the page you have some standout boxes you really want people to look at, you're going to have to flag that up within the text. So for example, you could say something along the lines of further information on all these reports is available through the links at the top right of the page. But you also have to remember there might be screen reader users as well who won't necessarily know where the top right of the page is. So I'd expect to see further information as a heading available on the page. And headings are really important to help navigation and provide structure. If you don't know how to use headings, then check out my other video based on them. But headings are a way for screen reading software to jump through sections of a page. They're also really useful for structuring your page for dyslexic users and actually any user to make sure that your key points stand out and you'll f you have a flow through the content that you're trying to present. You have to also ensure that all non-text content, as we've mentioned before with images, have a text equivalent. This is because screen reading software cannot read images or text contained within images. Screen reading software can only read plain text, which might be embedded within the alt uh, attribute, or it might be just the text on the page. All links should also be descriptive. So if you have a link that says click here, if you can think of how a screen reading software might present a, a list of all the links of the page, it might read out click here, click here, click here, click here, but have no context as to what click here is actually going to. So make sure that your links have a description to them or they provide some contextual information. So for example, just say my latest work on accessibility, provide that as a link. You don't need to prompt people to click here to download or click here to view. If you're trying to present sort of a series of links within um, a table, for example, you're trying to present um, different material about different topics, then make the links the titles of those topics. Related to this, all file downloads should have a meaningful file name and near the link show the file type as well. And what I mean by that is instead of just calling your files very generic titles, Give them something specific so that when a user is downloading them, looking them back on their computer, they know exactly what that file is before they have to open it up. You can imagine if you're using a screen reading software, then if you've just got lots of files called slides, you're going to have to open up every single one of those files to find the one you're looking for. And that means opening up the file, opening up the new program, 
navigating through the, the interface of that program to read the file and then close it down. And that could be quite a laborious process. So correct naming of files and descriptive naming of files are really useful. And I've mentioned there putting um, a description of what type of file it is that you're, you're asking them to download as well, because there's no point downloading a file if you don't have the software to open it. Or if you're opening the file and you're not sure what software is going to be opening, it's more useful to have that description within the uh, near the download link. That could just be simply putting in square brackets word dot doc or powerpoint.pptx. So to conclude then, accessibility is a legal and it's a moral issue as well. We, you know, there's a right here to make sure that what we provide online is available to everyone. You have to consider all aspects of your web resources too. Don't, don't just think about the text on your page. Think about the images and the downloads and the, the way you're inviting your users to navigate around your site. Make reasonable adjustments to enable all users to engage with your content. But remember, accessibility benefits everyone. The improvements you make to your website will benefit all users, make your website more enjoyable to use and make it more engaging to use as well. There are many web resources out there which provide more detail on the measures you can take to address accessibility. And I'll provide a link to those on my personal website at mattcornock.co.uk.